Hell's Kitchen is known for high standards, but these dishes were a complete nightmare. Jeremy Madden from season 12 was quite the character, earning his title without much effort. Right, stop, stop. Right from the start, his incompetence was clear. He messed up the blue team's entire day, which says a lot. Ray Alonghi might have blamed the pans for dropping eggs. I communicate. Are you guys walking with the omelet? 30 seconds, please. But Jeremy's lack of communication was even worse. He's not even answering me. Jeremy, can I get an omelet? Remember when Jeremy couldn't hear the order and Chef Ramsay asked about it? Hey, Chef. Oh, fuck me. Jeff. It's dead weight, plain and simple. I mean, he's. The guy straight up admitted he didn't hear a thing. Jeremy standing in the middle there like that when he's breaking. And that's not all. He even had the nerve to stand up to Chef Ramsay despite not being able to make croissants right. At least he excelled at one thing, just standing there doing nothing. Jeremy, walk! Come on, big boy! Did he blank out or something? Chef Ramsay was just as confused as everyone else, wondering what was up with Jeremy. I communicate! Are you guys walking with the omelet? 30 seconds, please. It's unfortunate when one team member's lack of communication and skills brings down the whole team's performance. To the person we put up for elimination, very first service. Two smoked salmon, 30 seconds, yes? Me Being able to communicate and execute tasks in the kitchen is crucial, and Jeremy's failure to do so was frustrating for everyone involved. To the person we put up for elimination, very first service. Two smoked salmon, 30 seconds, yes? And for all of us watching too. Hopefully, Jeremy learned from this experience and improved his kitchen skills. Sometimes, mistakes and failures can lead to growth and improvement. But Jeremy's kitchen mishaps didn't stop there. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, he stirred up even more trouble. After finally bringing the croissant to the pass, Jeremy had a sudden realization. Get over there and help play the smoked salmon. I'm gonna walk. Smoked you have a Where the hell was the smoked salmon? Jeremy's sense of urgency led him to rush things, asking for a plate from Dan Ryan before the dish was finished. Come on! Watch your back, watch your back now. It's like he just wanted to get things over with, completely ignoring the rules. When all the plates were lined up at the pass, Chef Ramsay quickly noticed something fishy with one of them. All of you! I'm a son, Chef. Some disgusting pit. And guess whose plate it was? Jeremy's. But this wasn't just any plate, and I think you already know what he brought to the pass. Scrambled eggs that I cooked an hour ago. Make sure you get the sample plates. These guests, they save lives on a daily basis. Yeah, it's hard to believe how dense he could be at that moment. Did he even realize it was the sample? Chef Ramsay couldn't believe his eyes and didn't hold back in giving Jeremy an earful for his mistake. Survives on a daily basis, and you want to serve that? Me, Dad, you can kill someone with that. It's it's moments like these that make me wonder if I'm watching the same show these guys are competing in. And for Jeremy, well, it seemed like he had no idea where he was either. So I've been covering more cheating moments than I can count over the last couple of weeks. Think I missed any? I probably did, so get in the comments and let me know, or leave me a message on any of my social media pages. Let's start with Jason Underwood. In the high-stakes kitchen of Hell's Kitchen, where talented chefs compete for the ultimate prize, there have been some unforgettable failures. But one chef stood out as a true culinary disaster, Jason. From his lazy approach to his terrible kitchen performance, Jason proved over and over that he was a horrible fit for the intense world of Hell's Kitchen. Anyone out there disagree? Right from the beginning, Jason's lack of dedication and passion for cooking was obvious. During the signature dish challenge, Chef Ramsay didn't hold back, slamming Jason's lackluster dish and comparing it to something tinned in a can. Now, I'm pretty sure you remember that. And you're just hopeless! That was pretty insulting, right? While the other contestants showed off their skills and ambition, Jason's mediocrity was a warning sign from the beginning. But hey, it's not a crime to have average skills. The real problem was that he seemed to be wasting a golden opportunity that others would die for. Throughout the competition, Jason's lack of commitment became more and more obvious. During one dinner service, Chef Ramsay called out the first ticket, but Jason was nowhere to be found. Seriously, where was he? You can't get it when he fucking puts me on the spot like that, dude. I can't. Yep, he was casually smoking and picking his toes, completely ignoring the demanding kitchen environment and his fellow chefs. And you know what? When the whole team needed coordination and cooperation to win, his behavior was totally out of line. Even when he was fighting to stay in the competition, Jason didn't show the fire and determination that Chef Ramsay looks for in a true chef. I don't know why I'm trying to break out of that. I'm doing a little... Jeez, this makes me wonder, how did he even make it this far? His inability to push through challenges and improve ultimately got him eliminated. And thank God for that! Then came the moment when Chef Ramsay asked the teammates to pick a nominee and explain why. 
And what one of the teammates had to say wasn't a surprise at all. Jason. His poor performance and indifferent attitude made him a liability in the kitchen, and Chef Ramsay's decision to send him home was completely justified. But wait for it, because what Jason said next was absolutely unbelievable. I, I have yet to totally prove myself. I get nervous. Did he really just say that? After everything that went down, I can't believe he still had the nerve to claim he had so much to prove. After all the disrespect he showed his team, I would have just walked away. It's not just about the team as a whole, but about respecting each and every chef. And Jason missed that mark by a mile. Unfortunately for Jason, that passion never ignited and his time on Hell's Kitchen ended disappointingly. But thinking about it, if his attitude had been better, do you think he would have stayed in the competition longer? Let me know in the comments below. Meanwhile, what this next chef did in the intense environment of Hell's Kitchen wasn't any better than what Jason did. Johnny McDevitt stood out as a bully and misogynist during the 16th season. He made snarky comments and showed a lack of respect for his fellow contestants, especially targeting women. Despite bragging about his cooking skills, Johnny's performance was lackluster throughout the competition. One memorable incident involved him belittling Kimberly and Ryan's almost perfect dish, revealing his disdain for talented female chefs. Do you remember this moment when he so unabashedly let his feelings loose? Happened. Who taught her to cook like that? It's really annoying when, like, cute little girl. Whoa, Johnny, did you really say that out in the open in front of all those cameras and viewers at home? But karma came around because Kimberly ended up winning and snagging a top head chef job in Las Vegas. You should have seen how bewildered Johnny looked. He totally had that coming, right? But Johnny's unapologetic attitude didn't stop there. He straight up admitted to being a bully on TV, not caring about the millions of viewers who didn't like him. He made Jessica Boyton cry after she celebrated her team's win, showing he couldn't handle losing gracefully. That was way out of bounds. And here comes more shockingly disrespectful stuff from a guy who should have been a gentleman all along. Why you even look at me? Like, just stop talking to me for the rest of the season. Who talks like that, seriously? And there's more. In another episode, he tried to crush Kimberly's spirit, but she stood up to him fearlessly, showing she was tougher than his bullying. Come on, man, it's totally outdated and gross to treat women like they're just objects to be walked all over. Johnny never saw it coming that Kimberly would bounce back stronger than ever. And guess what? He got a taste of his own medicine. Come on, because at the end of the day, I it's cook the end of the day, ass. Splinter. Why don't you start acting like a gentleman? I'm so proud of her for standing up like that. But Johnny's bad attitude also showed in his teamwork, leading to some terrible dinner services. In the end, Johnny's iffy temper and mediocre skills got him kicked off the show. You completely screwed the kitchen. I'm sure all the ladies were relieved. Later on, the guy admitted he regretted his actions, saying he often said things he didn't mean during the tough competition. I hope he was telling the truth this time. So, outside of Hell's Kitchen, Johnny reportedly owns a cookie company in Philly. Hopefully, he's learned from his experiences and become a more respectful person. That's what really counts, learning from your mistakes. Now, in the tough cooking battle of Hell's Kitchen, one contestant really stood out for being totally lacking in empathy and acting like a bully. Season 18 had its own bad guy, Scott Lee, whose actions made everyone hope he'd get his comeuppance. Right from the start, it was clear Scott Lee didn't care much for his team. When a fellow contestant had an allergic reaction, Scott showed shocking indifference and called the person suffering a baby girl. That kind of insensitivity really showed how little he cared about others. You all right, baby girl? <laughs> Funny. Scott's insensitivity showed he didn't care about others' well-being. His disdain for his fellow competitors was clear during challenges and punishments. After their team lost the Chinese cuisine challenge, instead of helping with the penalty, he did what he wanted. His selfishness and lack of teamwork just made everyone feel more distant from him. But his worst was bullying Trev McGrath. Trev might not have been the best cook, but Scott's mean taunts went too far. It seemed like he enjoyed putting Trev down and showing he was better. A break, I guess. Scott didn't just have a bad rap on the show. On social media, he got a ton of hate and criticism from viewers who couldn't stand his behavior. People's reactions to his tweets really showed how much they disliked him, highlighting just how unlikable he was. And in the end, Scott Lee's journey in Hell's Kitchen showed he's just a guy driven by his own desires and stuck in a grudge. Now, the next contestant might be walking a similar path. Lacey D'Angelo is a prime example of a chef who struggled big time. From her boring signature dish to messing up repeatedly during dinner services, Lacey was a disaster in the kitchen. Her bad attitude and constant complaining didn't help either. During the signature dish challenge, Chef Ramsay ripped into her chicken and blackberry sauce dish from her corporate dining spot. That's definitely corporate. You serve, they eat. Yes, sir. He spat out her dish, saying it would make people puke right after eating it. 
Even with that brutal feedback, Lacey wouldn't own up to her lousy dish, making everyone see her as a flaky and lazy chef. During the competition, her attitude kept annoying her teammates, causing fights all through prep and dinner services. Honestly, because I don't have my experience. Even when she got another shot during the last dinner service, Lacey still couldn't turn things around. Her time on Hell's Kitchen showed she just wasn't cut out for the high-pressure world of cooking competitions. I can get back to my normal life. At least now I get some sleep. Despite her ambitions, Lacey's time on Hell's Kitchen will always be remembered for all the wrong reasons as she never managed to prove she was a competent or capable chef. Now, let's get into one of the most disrespectful moments in the show's history. We're talking about Joseph Tinnelly, a true rebel without a cause. When it was Joseph's turn to name the first nominee and give a reason, he decided to get a bit cheeky and veer off the expected path. Instead of just following the rules, he told Chef Ramsay that his teammates knew who they were and could speak for themselves. But Chef Ramsay wasn't having it. He pressed Joseph for a straight answer, but Joseph stayed defiant. In the end, he named Tony and Andy as the nominees, but you could still see the defiance in his tone. What do, what do you want me to fucking say? What do you want me to say? As the tension grew, Chef Ramsay's patience wore thin. <laughs> Listen, you chippy idiot. He even called Joseph kind of dumb and gave him one last shot to answer right. But Joseph just couldn't let go of his stubbornness and brought up Tony again, saying he knew the reason why. Not only did Joseph disrespect Chef Ramsay, but he also started dissing his fellow contestants during all this chaos. What was this guy's deal, seriously? To be an executive chef? Shut yeah? your fucking mouth. Oh my god. We get it, you're fond of the F word. Chef Ramsay, rightfully ticked off by Joseph's disrespect, firmly told him his time was up. It was clear Joseph needed to leave, and he made his exit in a dramatic way. Through the whole mess, Joseph's half-baked attitude and big mouth were front and center. It was obvious his tough guy act wasn't impressing anyone, especially not Chef Ramsay. Moving on in the cooking world, there's this chef named Suzanne Schleicht who claims she could outcook anyone. But her overconfidence and arrogance ended up being her downfall. Throughout season 6 of Hell's Kitchen, it became clear Suzanne wasn't the culinary genius she thought she was. Right from the start, Suzanne's cockiness was evident during the signature dish challenge. She served up a Fontaine risotto, boasting it was perfect, but Chef Ramsay quickly saw it was overcooked. Even though she clearly messed up, Suzanne stubbornly rejected the criticism, only to have Chef Ramsay spit it right back at her. Her unwillingness to take feedback showed she wasn't ready to improve as a chef. Despite being up for elimination several times, Suzanne somehow managed to dodge the bullet each time. But she definitely got some tough criticism along the way. You know, I do know how to cook. I do know how to cook meat. I know how to cook. So she went through that a bunch of times. In the end, Suzanne's time on Hell's Kitchen showed that having talent alone doesn't cut it to be a great chef. And that's exactly what this next chef from season two, Sarah Horowitz, needed to learn. Sarah stood out not just for her mean attitude, but also for her wild antics like tearing her shirt off like the Hulk and even messing up her own team's efforts. Get back on the line. I just thought maybe this shine, that maybe I... But the stories about her cruel actions didn't stop there. A Reddit user revealed that Sarah had a history of being a bully in school, causing a lot of pain to her victims and always putting others down to make herself look better. It seems like her toxic behavior was something she'd been doing for a long time. Sarah's bad behavior didn't stop with the show. When she was working as a tour chef for Justin Bieber, she made headlines after allegedly getting arrested for a violent fight with her boyfriend. <laughs> it was clear that Sarah's actions weren't just one-off incidents, but part of a pattern of hurtful behavior. Her nasty attitude and willingness to hurt others for her own gain showed up both on the show and in her personal life. Despite how editing might have played a role, Sarah's true self came through, leaving a strong impression as someone who didn't seem to change her ways. And now, let's talk about a chef who brought a whole lot of disrespect to the table, Raj Branston. While top-notch chefs battled it out for glory in the culinary world, Raj stood out not for his cooking skills or dedication, but for how bad he was. Coming from Queens, New York, with an impressive 35 years in kitchens, Raj's journey on season 8 was a roller coaster of disrespect. Right from the start, it was clear Raj's skills were shaky at best. During the signature dish challenge, his seafood and vegetable pancake left Chef Ramsay completely baffled. Yeah, it's a pancake. What? That is a pancake? With oil dripping out of the mess, Chef Ramsay joked that it looked like it had taken a leak. It definitely wasn't a pancake, and Raja's poor presentation earned him a solid zero out of one, sealing his fate as the loser in that round. As the competition went on, Raj didn't get any better. When he was put on waiter duty during dinner service, he struggled to explain the specials and was completely useless in the kitchen. Chef Ramsay gave him a choice, either pitch in or fuck off. Your customers and tell them you fucked it up. I need so I need In the end, Raja's run in Hell's Kitchen came to a fitting end. 
he got kicked out for being the weakest link and totally out of his league. Raj's stint in the competition was basically a masterclass in culinary disaster. E. Big time. Raj Branston, despite his 35 years in the kitchen, showed that quantity doesn't always mean quality. His time in Hell's Kitchen was a total disaster, proving what happens when someone is way out of their league in the culinary world. Next, let's talk about Brian Gallagher. In this episode of Hell's Kitchen, things got pretty intense after the blue team lost the Indian Cuisine Challenge. You know how losing can really suck, right? Well, for Bryant, it was even worse. During the elimination talks, Bryant got into a major argument with Aaron and Sade. Yeah. The communication was incredible. The disrespect here was totally out of line. It was a clash of personalities big time. Bryant tried to act tough and intimidating, but honestly, he just came off as really insecure. Meanwhile, Sade handled the situation calmly and with some sharp sarcasm, making her seem like the one who had it all figured out. She definitely had her act together compared to Bryant, who couldn't keep his cool. It got kinda amusing when Bryant dared the team to nominate him, acting like he could handle anything. But Aaron shot back, telling him his crappy attitude wouldn't fly as an executive chef. Right? One. Okay, how about the other night? Right. Couldn't hang in there with fish. Man, there's a whole cringe fest happening here. Bryant claimed he was acting all grown up, but his actions spoke way louder than his words. After the episode aired, people on Reddit were even cracking jokes about Bryant's meltdown, calling it a budget Eminem impression in a rap battle. It was pretty embarrassing for him and showed a side that was just plain immature and temperamental. So these were some of the most disrespectful moments ever on Hell's Kitchen that left us all shocked and shaking our heads. It really shows a side of the culinary world filled with cringy meltdowns and epic clashes. From Jason Underwood's lack of commitment to Brian's total toddler tantrum, these unforgettable moments have become a huge part of the show's wild history. Now we want to hear from you. Which moment was the most disrespectful of them all? Share your thoughts and reactions in the comments below. Ever wonder what it's like to be the one responsible for that single mistake that cost the entire team the win? That's exactly what Elizabeth Bianchi from Season 9 had to go through. In Episode 6, Hell's Kitchen threw a reunion bash for Culver City High School's Class of 91, celebrating 20 years since graduation. And you know, any good reunion needs great food, so they kicked things off with a challenge to decide what dishes would make the menu. To start things rolling, Paul Niederman and Elizabeth sat down with Chef Ramsay to hash it out with the committee members. By the end of the meeting, the committee settled on a fun Hawaiian theme with pork and scallops as the star dishes. Sure, things went sideways real quick. During their powwow, one of the committee folks dropped that she was a pescatarian who wouldn't touch meat of any kind. As they kept chatting, Elizabeth started to sweat bullets because she'd never whipped up Hawaiian grub before. But hey, that's why they're a team, right? Well, not in this case. The issue was Elizabeth kind of lumped Hawaiian cuisine with Asian eats. Yeah, Hawaii is a hot spot for Japanese tourists and their food scenes mingle, but the island's culinary roots go way deeper than that. And let's not even start on that doozy of a question Elizabeth threw out. Seriously, Elizabeth? Everyone was scratching their heads, Paul included. Later on, back with their teams, Elizabeth did the unthinkable. She fed her crew all the wrong details. They went all out, cooking their hearts out, only to find out they'd been running in the wrong direction the whole time. When Chef Ramsay revealed the theme, the entire red team, except Elizabeth, was flat out shocked. No surprise the red team couldn't even score a single point while the blue team cruised to what might be the easiest win in Hell's Kitchen history. And the red team's downfall was that nothing they served screamed Hawaiian. Even though one dish tasted spot on, it got axed for not having any island vibes. But wait, there's more. Elizabeth dropped the ball on another crucial detail. Eh. When they dished out scallops with bacon to the pescatarian? Yeah, that didn't fly. Meanwhile, the blue team was coasting through this challenge. As long as they put something on the plate that had been within sniffing distance of a pineapple, they were golden. Some of them even went to the extent of calling her an iconic disaster. Maybe she thought they'd overlook the theme if the food tasted great? But when a committee member couldn't even eat their food, that was a major disrespect. And just when you think it can't get any crazier, here comes a chef trying to defy the laws of physics. Let's see how that worked out. Wendy Liu from Season 1 might just go down as one of the worst contestants ever. And that's pretty much solidified when she gave Chef Ramsay one of the most absurd explanations ever. In the third episode, Wendy was handling the appetizer station. That night, two big shot food critics, Melissa Clark and Kate Crater, were dining in. So, obviously making a good impression was crucial. But boy, did they mess up the appetizer's timing. 20 minutes into dinner service. And when Chef Ramsay checked on the blue team, he found out their spaghetti wasn't even boiled yet. And here's the reason why that was the case. It's not boiling. 
That's when Chef Ramsay asked Wendy if she topped it with cold water, and her response left him speechless. Water was supposed to boil faster than hot water. I'm at a loss for words here, folks. As expected, the internet went wild after this episode aired. While most viewers roasted her, one person actually felt sorry for her. Yeah, from what I recall, a lot of the contestants in Season 1 weren't exactly culinary pros. Wendy, coming from an account management background, was a prime example of how passion for cooking doesn't always equal skill in the kitchen. When Wendy finally got her spaghetti cooking, it didn't win over the critics. Melissa thought it was chewy, and that definitely wasn't a good beginning. And then tomatoes, and it doesn't come together. But when Wendy switched to the meat station, she struggled there too. I think part of the issue was that she was a vegetarian. And so I just was completely lost. It's really tough to gauge cooking times and temperatures if you're not familiar with the ingredients, especially if you don't eat them yourself. She had to rely heavily on Ralph Pagano's advice just to make any progress, and boy was she struggling. All she seemed to have left were excuses. It's me this time, no, 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 no. time. Everything I tell you. And we all know how Chef Ramsay feels about excuses. That was enough for Chef Ramsay to think Wendy didn't have the drive or passion to work with him. You come back with the most pathetic answers. Yes, chef. But the next chef, now that's a whole different story. This chef had the potential to go far if it weren't for his temper issues. Enter Joy Parham Thomas from season 12. Despite being kind of a jerk, she was undeniably talented. She was actually the first to earn a black jacket after impressing Chef Ramsay and the guest judges with her winning dish. Even Chef Ramsay had high hopes for her but she made a real boneheaded move on the second day of the Black Jacket dinner service. In episode 18, Hell's Kitchen had the honor of hosting the legendary Stan Lee for dinner. Everyone was beyond hyped just to see him, let alone serve him. Joy was handling the fish station, and things seemed smooth with Rochelle Bergman and Jason Zapaltas until she sent out her halibut dish before Rochelle was ready with hers. Us back every time food was dying. I'm sorry, it's taking forever. I had quite a few things to get up. Joy was a hot mess because she also forgot about the sauce for the halibut, and when she finally got the sauce ready, she didn't plate any mussels. I shouldn't Ooh, have on, to communicate to the garnish when the garnish is standing right close no, to the no, no, Joy's was livid when she forgot about the sauce, but with the mussels, it was clear that she had lost it. No. If you recall, during the very first dinner service, Joy threw a fit when she got frustrated. But looking back, that tantrum seems tame compared to what happened next. Joy completely lost it. She did better on the second try, but still struggled with communication. Naturally, that didn't sit well with Chef Ramsay. But instead of making up for it, she began giving Chef Ramsay some lip. Rule number one in Hell's Kitchen, never sass Chef Ramsay. Red team, have you reached a decision? Yes, yes chef. chef. Joy didn't step up her game even after that incident. Everyone knows Chef Ramsay always demands that garnishes be ready before the main dish, and Jason, who was handling the garnish station, still needed another minute and a half to get everything ready. But Joy didn't care and served her halibut anyway. This caused Chef Ramsay to take her aside. Instead of owning up to her mistakes and getting back to work, she chose to escalate the situation. Dated by the garnishes. Chef Ramsay wasn't a fan of her behavior, and he decided to show her how he felt. Water, but never ahead. And with that, Joy lost it for the last time. Wendy, Shayna, Kimberly, Matt, step forward, please. Melanie Finch and Rochelle begged her not to quit, but Joy stuck with her decision and walked out. Wendy, why do you think you should stay? Chef Ramsay went after her and called her out for being selfish. I mean, ditching her whole team like that was totally unprofessional, and she definitely deserved to be called out for it. Good verbal skills, good communication, do everything I can for a team. What followed was an argument of an even more massive scale. What's going on? Matt has an attitude. Everybody just talked to him because he's all pissed off. I just, it's hard for me to work with incompetence. Back in the dorms, after having a conversation with sous chef Andy about what happened, Joy came to her senses. She even thought about apologizing to Chef Ramsay, but then she decided against it. On Reddit, someone Joy's Insta, where she wrote about why she left Hell's Kitchen. She wrote saying, Production tried to f me over. It didn't excite people to see a black woman. Just put her head down and cook. They always find a black woman to villainize, and I wasn't going to let that happen to me. Wait, did she forget about Rock and Janelle? Moreover, she even got the chance to dine in with Rock after winning the black jacket. That should have been an unforgettable experience. In the same post, a user found the whole explanation and accusation ridiculous. The user also wrote, whether or not production targeted her is not the point since she still quit and walked out in front of everyone. Not to mention that Julia made it to fourth, Bobby made it to fifth, Rock won, Elise made it to third, when she shouldn't have, Barbie made it to fourth, and fucking Janelle also won. Another user wrote that maybe Joy found story editor notes and not an actual script. The user also wrote, uh, These shows are filming 24 sevens for just under a month. That's a lot of footage to go through. 
so they have story editors on site to help keep things organized for the editors in post-production. My best guess is the paper Joy found were the story editor notes for the previous challenge. Not to say Joy doesn't have some points. Reality TV is always going to be shady. The players are always the last thing on the producers' minds when filming these shows. Their focus is producing the best TV possible, so shady shit will always happen. I think leaving the show like that was a major blunder. Plus, those accusations she threw out are no joke. They need some serious backup. These horrifying plates were so bad they left Gordon Ramsay fuming and this contestant scrambling to redeem themselves. The three sleep, the three, three halibut, the two, two, uh. At first, Jeremy appeared enthusiastic about creating a stuffed steak. My signature dish will be a stuffed steak. I love meat, cheese, and onions. Why not put them together? He was the third contestant from the blue team to face Ramsay's critique, and he went head to head with Susan in the signature dish challenge. Presenting his stuffed steak creation topped with smoked gouda, Jeremy stood before Chef Ramsay. However, things quickly got confusing during the questioning. When asked about his job, Jeremy mentioned he was a lead cook. Hmm. Well, sticking that little detail into the back of his head, Chef Ramsay probed deeper, questioning the meat's identity. And what is that, a ribeye? What well, no, it's not a ribeye, Chef. What is it? I think it's a, uh, I think it's a ribeye. I'm sorry. The poor guy wavered, hesitating back and forth on whether his chosen cut was a ribeye or not, before settling on this. I think it's a ribeye. Yes, it Chef. It looks like a ribeye. I believe it is a ribeye, Chef. The red flag was waving high and proud when Chef Ramsay sensed Jeremy's uncertainty. Oh, believe me, the supposed lead cook seems so lost and flustered. And Chef Ramsay's critique didn't sugarcoat the situation either, expressing disappointment in the texture due to the stuffing. When you slice into a steak of that quality, you destroy the fibers and the texture because you're stuffing. The following day, while the guys were locked in and working together during prep, Jeremy seemed a bit out of his element. Did anybody see how he preheated up the potato puree? Okay. He bombarded his teammates with a flurry of questions and plain old struggle to keep up. Anthony and Jeremy stepped in to assist, especially when Jeremy confessed that he was clueless. This was naturally concerning because he was proving to be a liability. I think his inexperience chance through. I don't know how to make a point. To, I'm just a little concerned right now. When the first dinner service kicked off, Jeremy found himself at the garnish station alongside Raymond. Initially, he seemed to sync well with Michael during the first batch of entrees. However, trouble loomed as a minor fire sparked up on a station, causing a raised eyebrow from Zach, who caught sight of the singed kale. I can see the kale literally catching fire, getting burnt. Although Zach did offer a helping hand, Jeremy didn't respond quite as kindly. Worry about your side, let me do my side, yeah? Motherfucker, what? Good teamwork, boys. Things only got worse during the next round when Chef Ramsay called out orders for three halibuts, one bass, and one chicken. Sadly, Jeremy struggled to relay the order back accurately even after being corrected by Dan. Jeremy's repeated fumbles were really getting on Chef Ramsay's nerve at this point. What are we going with? Two, uh, two halibuts and one chicken chef. Three halibuts. Three halibuts and one chicken chef. Despite Chef Ramsay's second attempt at the order, Jeremy continued to stumble over it, which only added fuel to the fire. Anthony had a beautiful quip cooked up, though. Jeremy, he's telling it to you. Just say it right back, man. Pretty sure birds can do that. <laughs> Honestly, he's got the best confessionals on the show, hands down. Anyway, the famous chef had to repeat the order for a third time, but Jeremy couldn't get it right. Consequently, he became the fourth person from the blue team to face expulsion from the kitchen. What's going? The three halibut, two... Get out! And yeah, he deserved it. However, back at the dorms, Jeremy seemed baffled by his dismissal. He failed to comprehend why he got the boot simply for faltering and repeating the order. I got kicked out of the kitchen because I couldn't repeat back the order. You got to repeat back the order. Dude, communication was crumbling. After a disappointing service that led to the blue team's loss, they faced the daunting task of nominating two individuals for elimination. During the deliberations, Jeremy pointed out Sebastian and Michael for their struggles with the appetizers and meat respectively. However, the tables turned swiftly as Sebastian tagged Jeremy as one of the weakest links on the team. What's more, John criticized Jeremy for his inability to repeat an order, sparking frustration in Jeremy deeply. Well, That's I'm cool. something and you ain't nothing. Because you stepping on me real hard, bro. None of us no, are he just right stepped now. on me real hard. Tensions escalated when Jeremy found himself in a heated exchange with Zach. It was all regarding the tone Jeremy used while addressing Zach after the kale incident. The argument intensified when Zach bluntly told Jeremy that he couldn't cook. I'm not doing it good. You ain't doing it I'm good. I'm 22. I got a lead position. Watch when he has step on you when I'm bigger. This remark really hit a nerve, igniting Jeremy's anger. I'm getting that stupid restaurant in Vegas, and I'll be better than everybody else. Calling the prize stupid? Yeah, nice. 
But to everyone's surprise, he somehow survived elimination. Who ordered the Caesar? I mean the Greek. Whoopsie. We just give it a little bit of room and this is so embarrassing you have no idea. And then came the dreaded breakfast service. Oh boy, here we go. Jeremy was handling the croissant station, but things went haywire right off the bat. On the first ticket, he went radio silent, which got Chef Ramsay's blood boiling. Jeremy, I, I, you don't even answer me. To make matters even worse, when confronted, Jeremy admitted that he didn't catch the order, sending Chef Ramsay's soul out of his body. Can I get an answer from you? Yes, you can. What was that callback? I wasn't able to hear it, Chef. The chaos continued when Anthony called out 30 seconds for his omelet. Instead of getting a grip on his timing, Jeremy seemed lost, asking Anthony how much time he needed while chilling with his croissant. I communicate. Are you guys walking with the omelet? 30 seconds, please. How much longer on you guys? His crew tried to redirect him, Anthony repeated the countdown, but Jeremy, still clueless, asked for a time check again. More. Get more ready. He's just like, Duh. Then Jeremy just stood there, clutching his croissant, seemingly frozen in front of a station, accomplishing absolutely nothing. And just like you'd expect, Chef Ramsay's frustration hit the roof at this point. Jeremy standing in the middle of the air like that with his breakfast. Come around then, big boy! He strutted over to the pass with his croissant, but uh-oh, the smoked salmon was MIA. So Jeremy dashed back, asking Dan for a plate. Dan, in the final stretch of his tasks, told him no dice, but Jeremy snagged one anyway. Can I walk this plate? No. Watch your back, watch your back, come on. But there was a twist. Some disgusting pig brought me the sample scrambled eggs. Yeah, turns out that disgusting pig was Jeremy. And yeah, he brought the sample that a certain celebrity chef named Gordon Ramsay cooked up an hour ago. You might have heard of him, right? Chef Ramsay lost it. Everyone was pretty bummed by the colossal mess up and asked Jeremy to grab a rubber spatula from the back. Jeremy should have been able to look at that and go, that looks like it's really old. Find me a rubber spatula, please. Jeremy really shit the bed on this. Here, here. While Jeremy was out of the kitchen, the rest of the dudes hustled and nailed their first order. When things were winding down, Jeremy clapped his hands in premature celebration. Dan quickly shut that down, telling him to hold off on the celebrations till they actually finished. Hold on, don't stop right here. Don't stop right here. Was he just the biggest donkey on HK or what? If you think that he was, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. By the way, you can now become a member of the channel by hitting this tab right here. And believe me, that's all you gotta do for some cool perks coming your way. Anyway, despite being on the winning team, Jeremy's time on Hell's Kitchen hit a dead end. His attempt to serve up a damn sample plate turned out to be the nail in the coffin for him. Chef Ramsay wasn't having any of it, considering it a major health code violation and a clear sign that Jeremy was out of his league. In his exit interview, Jeremy owned up to bringing the wrong plates but remained defiant. He even boldly proclaimed this. It was my fault. I brought up the wrong plate. I've learned a lot about myself. I know I'm a fighter and above all, I'm a great chef. But hey, don't go too hard on him. Remember what the doctor said. Doctor said I wasn't eating enough. She said that I need to eat more. By the way, if Jeremy had a female version, it would be her. Ginger, ginger cookie, ginger crusted cookie. chicken breast. Yeah, that's what's in there. She crumbled how? Well, during the signature dish challenge, Chris has stepped up as the sixth contestant from the red team to present her creation to Chef Ramsay. Her contender was Michael, and she showcased a ginger crusted chicken breast. For whatever reason, she drew inspiration from the cookie aisle during her grocery store outings. As you were inspired in the cookie aisle, not the fucking pet food aisle. Yeah, his reaction wasn't as pleasant as expected. He straight up spat out her dish, calling it hideous, which hit Krissa really hard. She only managed to scrape up one point, leaving her feeling super embarrassed. Especially since apparently customers loved her food. I'm not really used to people spitting out my food, so it was very embarrassing. Then, during the prep phase, Krissa stood out as the only female team member appearing uncertain about her tasks. A little bit more salt would have, would have been good. Okay. And you put a little bit too much garlic. Her struggle to nail a flawless risotto became evident when T pointed out the dish's shortcomings. There was an excess of garlic, insufficient salt, and the absence of both chives and lobster. Feeling really overwhelmed, Krissa confided in T, expressing her deep-seated fear and strong urge to straight up quit the competition. I just want to run out of here. What do you mean you want to run out of here? I'm just terrified. As the dinner service drew near to a close, Chef Ramsay noticed Krissa was really distracted. In a very unexpected move, she asked the puzzled Chef Ramsay for a bathroom break just before the service commenced. Krissa disappears to the bathroom before she pees her knickers. She truly wanted to escape that bad, huh? And then, during the first dinner service, she found herself stationed at the garnish station alongside Sarah. 
We're gonna have two pork. What? Two pork. Two pork. We're okay right now. I know. We're okay. Unfortunately, she appeared lost again. She was continually checking tickets and causing frustration for Sarah and sous chef Andy due to her indecisiveness and lack of focus. Should I work on dessert or help other people or anything? We are not on dessert already. Chef Andy's expressions. <laughs> it's almost as if she was watching a horror movie or something. Megan, get on, get on here. Right behind. But even when Megan stepped in to assist Sarah, Krissa seemed unable to find her footing. Instead, she appeared to be idling, squandering precious time, and contributing minimally to the team's efforts. It was a challenging night for her to say the very least, especially given her struggle to get into the rhythm of the kitchen and contribute effectively to the team's success. Sarah, yes, sir. why is she hiding? I don't know, Chef. Chef Ramsay took notice of this, and Krissa was reassigned to assist T with the tableside dish in the dining room. Eventually, the red team ended up losing, prompting them to nominate two individuals for elimination. Get out! Get out! Although Krista wasn't formally discussed as a candidate, her actions during the nomination process didn't sit well with her teammates. Why are you over there doing dishes? Cause like, I don't wanna argue. Instead of engaging in the crucial discussion, she was seen doing dishes which irked Christine deeply. Accusations flew around with Christine pointing out Krista's apparent disinterest in the team's fate. Well, because I broke a glass, I wanted to clean it. I was going to put fresh coffee on for us. I'm sorry. But her team wasn't interested one bit. I want a cigarette and a W. Can you provide me with that? Oh, yeah. Good question. Anyway, ultimately, she ended up getting eliminated, which isn't much of a shocker. Seems like Krista underestimated just how cutthroat the competition could be. When someone asked me what was the matter, I was honest. We all go to the bathroom, and I was nervous about dinner service. I mean, she straight up asked T what goes in the risotto. How did she even make it this far? You can't even f***ing listen straight. Stand there. I asked for your jacket. But guess what? She thought the competition was beneath her. Just listen to this. I'm not gonna cry because I know I'm too good for this shit. Wait, 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 wait. There's way more where that came from. Chef Ramsay asked us before dinner service. Are you okay? That makes me weak because I pay? Well, what can I say? You do you, Krissa. And well, guess who this reminds me of? Well, I'm ready to do a backflip right now, baby. A backflip. Yep, Louis backflipped the f*** out of HK on day one. He stepped up as the second contestant from the blue team during the signature dish challenge, facing off against Tech. He proudly presented a dish of sausage gravy over, well, biscuits. Well, f*** me. Wow, daring today, aren't we? What's more, he boasted to Chef Ramsay that it was a regular item on the menu at his diner, a steal at 475 along with a cup of coffee. Gallons, what Gallons. you serve it to pigs? Actually, I, got, I own a diner. But it was hard to rip off Chef Ramsay. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with it? It tastes like gunk. Louis felt personally affronted, unable to digest Ramsay's reaction. He couldn't wrap his head around the fact that Chef Ramsay found his dish so distasteful especially when hundreds and hundreds of customers chowed down on it weekly at his diner without complaints. Hundreds of people eat that in my diner every week. I don't think it was worth spitting out. But he got lucky. Despite losing the round to Tech, his team managed to snag the win in the challenge with a narrow 3-2 victory. And when Louis caught wind of the red team's punishment, having to clean both kitchens, he made a rather tone-deaf comment. He blurted out some sexist remarks, exaggerating the age-old stereotype that women were better at cleaning than men. Women are the best at cleaning, so it's right up their alley. But Louis wasn't the only one to make such ridiculous comments. Make sure to watch this video to see who I'm talking about. Anyway, let's get back to Louis. As the blue team reveled in the reward, Louis made quite the scene. He made a splash in the hot tub and kept the champagne flowing with his crew. Now it's time for his first and only service. Louis found himself stationed at the meat station. On the entrees, Chef Ramsay caught him in the act, committing a kitchen crime. Did you just put a lamb in the oven? Yes. Oh my god. Uh-huh. He placed raw lamb in the oven without seasoning or searing it beforehand. And it clearly got under Chef Ramsay's skin since he took a moment to school Louis on the importance of searing. I just see a meat. It's to lock in the juices, sir. To give it color, to improve the flavor. Despite the blunder, Louis's team rallied behind him, offering support and assistance at the meat station. It was a moment where teamwork kicked in, trying to rectify the mistake and keep the service rolling smoothly. Get a bunch of pans on and get them searing hot. Have Turn, back up render that fat. About an hour into the service, the boys had managed to serve appetizers for eight tables. However, Louis got caught red-handed yet again while working on Joseph's task of cooking spinach. He's cooking the spinach. Why? I don't know why. 
When questioned by Chef Ramsay, Louis explained that he thought it made sense to handle all the dishes together. I was just trying to get a head start. Maybe Chef Ramsay should just pull the panties out of his app. Wow, the nerve. But Chef Ramsay swiftly shut that down, instructing Louis not to touch the spinach. Especially considering the fact that the team was already facing considerable challenges with cooking the lamb. We got enough problems cooking lamb. I don't want you touching the fucking spinach. Okay. A little later, Louis finally sent his lamb dish up to the pass. However, the famous chef wasn't impressed one bit. He took a moment to school Louis on his lamb cutting skills. Like pointing out that one piece looked butchered, even jokingly asking Louis if he took a bite out of it. Did you bite that? That's one, that's the other. It's on the same fucking table! That iconic voice crack was the sign of impending doom. Then, Chef Ramsay stumbled upon a significant pile of wasted lamb at the meat station. Clearly frustrated, he angrily tossed all the wasted meat onto the station, demanding an explanation from Louis. Look at this! Look! What the f is this? This turned out to be the breaking point, leading Chef Ramsay to make a swift decision. He eliminated Louis on the spot. Louis! Yes, sir. F back there! Yes! Get! Oh, he wasn't nearly done. Get upstairs, get your bags packed. Can I help? Get out! Oh, boy. Following his elimination, Louis retreated to the dorms, packed his bags, and before exiting, he had some choice words for Chef Ramsay. He can kiss my fucking ass! But I've always wondered, was he purposely planted there? Louis getting the boot during the first service was really weird, but let's not forget that Robert suddenly reappeared on the scene. A little bit strange, right? All right, now here comes the undisputed winner of season 10. The winner of Hell's Kitchen is Tavon. <laughs> when he said he was an executive chef just at 22, I got a major existential crisis. Like, what the f am I doing with my life? You're 22. Yes. And you're an executive chef running a brigade of chefs. Yes. And then I saw his performance, and I was okay with being a YouTuber. In the signature dish challenge, Tavon stepped up as the 8th contestant from the blue team to present his creation to Chef Ramsay, facing off against Dana. He served up shrimp, scallops, and crab over fettuccine alfredo with a whiskey-infused sauce. However, Chef Ramsay's reaction wasn't quite what Tavon had hoped for. How much vinegar did you put in there? Like a drizzle. Drizzle? Well, more than a drizzle. He found that the dish was way too drenched in vinegar, describing it as hideous and having an unpleasant smell. I mean, it's hideous. I mean, it really is bad. I mean, really bad. In the end, he ended up losing the round to Dana. Wow, what a huge twist. And he took offense at Chef Ramsay's criticism of his dish. That's the first time anybody said my food was so fucked up on so many different levels. This is horrible. Well, apparently, that was the first time someone hated his food. Either way, after losing the challenge, Tavon expressed his frustration, visibly annoyed about being assigned cleaning duties. Can't shit get no worse than this than having Tavon washing dishes. Then, during his only dinner service, Tavon worked alongside Guy and Royce on the appetizer station. His performance hit a snag when he sent up a raw pigeon, leading to an infuriated Chef Ramsay's scathing remark. This fucking pigeon's that raw, it can still fly. Touch it. The famous chef, in disbelief, questioned Tavon's claim of being an executive chef. And then, Patrick expressed his concern, noting that Tavon was heading towards disaster. As the service progressed, Chef Ramsay then criticized Justin's undercooked scallops. It was then revealed that the scallops had been poorly sliced by Tavon, implicating him in the sabotage that led to Justin's subpar dish. Expensive hand dive scallops. You sabotaged them. Though poorly sliced doesn't really tell the whole story. Look at this one. Looked like they got caught with a paperclip. Fucking hell. Look. They described them in some really colorful terms. Butchered, mangled, road killed, you name it, they said it. My sides, you guys. Tavon treated those scallops like a homeless rat. Chef Ramsay, visibly exasperated, questioned Tavon's performance, expressing disbelief that an executive chef could falter so badly. Do you actually cook in your restaurants? Yeah. And do they do the same there? Yeah. No. And what was Tavon's excuse? I guess I froze. I mean, you froze. You haven't even fucking defrosted. Tavon seemed dismissive, almost brushing off Ramsay's criticism with a laugh. And this didn't sit well with Chef Ramsay, who, at his wit's end, promptly ejected Tavon from the kitchen and sent him packing back to the dorms. You think it's funny? All those f***ing customers? F*** up upstairs. Get out!
Tavon's seemingly nonchalant attitude about the situation marked his first expulsion from the kitchen. Chef Ramsay, you're a fucking douchebag. Naturally, he found himself in the hot seat as the blue team's initial nominee for elimination, alongside Don as the second. However, the famous chef swiftly dismissed their consensus as nonsense, redirecting the spotlight onto Tavon and Royce. During his plea, Tavon stepped up, owning his responsibility as the primary cause behind their kitchen mishaps. And that's when Chef Ramsay dug a little deeper, questioning Tavon about his self-assessment in kitchen roles. What would you rate your performance this evening? Line, chef, sous chef? A yeah, prep cook that got thrown onto the line. But, of course, Chef Ramsay didn't agree at all. I would have said dishwasher. The verdict was very clear. Tavon was shown the door, much to the relief of his fellow chefs. His poor showing on appetizers, mishandling of the scallops, and failure to meet Chef Ramsay's expectations, considering his executive chef status, sealed his fate. In his exit interview, Tavon expressed a great deal of annoyance at being the first one sent home packing. I'm looking forward to sit on my couch and see Royce as go the fuck home next week. Okay, okay, now make way for Miss Gross. A whiny, manipulative, hostile, and maybe even a bit racist contestant from the same season. In short, Tiffany was awful. I care a scale one to ten like a nine. In the second service, when she noticed missing scallop pieces and raised her concern, Barbie brushed it off, placing eight pieces on the tray. Feeling very slighted, Tiffany decided to take action. She sent up the incomplete order deliberately to shift the blame onto Barbie, accusing her of being unable to count. As the service continued, Barbie faced her own struggles, sending up two portions of overcooked scallops. Tiffany really seized the opportunity to accuse Barbie of sinking the team with her errors. Amidst further chaos, when Barbie encountered difficulties with the entrees, Tiffany suggested firing four sea basses as a safety measure. However, when Chef Ramsay spotted the prematurely fired sea basses, Tiffany revealed that she had instructed the women to do so. Chef Ramsay intervened, emphasizing that the fish had to be cooked on order. Despite this, Tiffany deflected the blame, feeling like it wasn't her fault. I don't understand why I'm getting yelled at. I'm trying to fucking put out food for the customer. I mean, I'm pissed off that he's mad at me. Eventually, after getting booted from the kitchen, deservedly, Tiffany's composure shattered. Back at the dorms, she unleashed a tirade of profanity, visibly agitated before angrily knocking her water bottle off the counter in a fit of frustration. I can get that shit, you What is wrong with you? I told you, she was hysterical. And on top of that, she instigated a bunch of drama. For example, following the Mexican cuisine challenge at the hot tub, Royce voiced his complaint about Mexicans not traditionally using flour tortillas. His skepticism extended to Kimmy, a Memphis native, as he adamantly refused to believe that she could craft a better taco than himself. Especially when you're going into a taco challenge, it's supposed to be somewhat traditional, you don't use flour tortillas. So while Tiffany was all about that no bitching policy, things took a wild turn. She couldn't resist the temptation and ended up chugging some wine, getting pretty tipsy, and guess what? Despite her big plan to keep things drama-free, as if she could, she went and spilled Royce's grievances to Kimmy and Robin. And the worst part is that she twisted Royce's words, pointing fingers at Danielle, Dana, and Christina. Like, oh, she's from the South, and why was she using flour tortillas type of shit? I got the fucking point though, right? That little bombshell caused a major rift in the red team, and you could still feel the tension the next day during the service. Dana, Danielle, and Christina are all talking behind my back. I just, I don't understand where all those girls' heads are at. But then again, she was put back in her place by sous chef Andy in her final service, and it was so satisfying to watch. Tiffany, sorry. No, you're fucking not. You're the floppiest cook I've ever seen my whole entire life. <sighs> she should have never lasted nearly as long as she did. What are your thoughts on that, though? And who else do you think deserved to be on this list? Make sure to drop your comments down below. And if you thought this video was crazy, don't forget to watch the next one right here since it's simply better.